I want you to think about the, what I'm going to talk about in terms of your own metabolism, but I'm going to be focusing on kids. So the exposome includes air pollution. It includes the air we breathe, and the air we breathe, even in a relatively clean air place like the Bay Area, still has contaminants. And of course, we know about power plants. California doesn't have too many of these smokestack uh, uh, power plants. Uh, unfortunately, the East Coast and the Midwest still burn coal. We don't. Uh, and, but our big problem in terms of air pollution is mostly traffic, traffic-related emissions. But I think I can also put up wildfires. As a sort of local air pollution health effects expert, I can tell you that uh, during the October Sonoma Napa fires, I think I did 15 media interviews. Uh, so it gets people's attention, wildfire smoke, but that's not uh, the only air pollution that we breathe. So there's smog, which California sort of made famous as photochemical uh, derived air pollution, meaning basically we cook in the sunny afternoons the motor vehicle emissions from the rush hour. And ozone is one of the secondary air pollutants that's created from emissions. Uh, nitrogen dioxide is a direct uh, emission that leads to ozone, but it's also harmful in and of itself. And then there's soot, which all our motor vehicles uh, emit. These are carbon particles. You know, whether it's gas or diesel-fueled uh, vehicles, they emit these fine particles. And this is an EPA slide that's sort of famous. You know, think about how big your hair is, the hair on top of your head. And fine particles, PM 2.5, that means they're 2.5 microns, are the little red things those are fine particles. They're what can be breathed right down into the lungs. And we think that they're uh, responsible for much of the health effects of particle pollution. So I think you probably all expect that the air we breathe in that's polluted will affect the lungs. Uh, that's where the PM 2.5 goes. And so you're not surprised that people cough and wheeze uh, when they're exposed to higher concentrations of air pollution. Some of you probably coughed and maybe wheezed during the wildfire uh, smoke of this year and then uh, last year. And some of you may even know, because there's been a fair amount of publicity about it, the American Heart Association actually thinks of, or actually cites air pollution as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease, such as a heart attack or stroke. But you may not think about air pollution and obesity. And so that's what I'm here to try to highlight. And I'm going to focus on kids. Uh, Several studies of children in Los Angeles, and at least one in New York City, have shown associations with traffic-related air pollution, TRAP for short. Uh, and then there's also been a, there's also a linkage of diabetes and obesity. It's been alluded to today, uh, but type 2 diabetes is a disorder of glucose metabolism. The body cells fail to take up uh, glucose from the blood and that's due to insulin resistance. And this cartoon up there shows at the top sort of a normal response uh, of uh, the insulin receptors of our cells to uh, an increased glucose load from a meal, for example. And then the bottom half shows that uh, there's insulin resistance, that the receptors are not as good at, at uh, at responding insulin and bringing glucose into the cell. So you end up with a higher blood sugar level, the fasting blood sugar uh, that many of us get measured periodically. And you know, 80% of those who develop type 2 diabetes are obese. So there's a clear linkage between obesity uh, and insulin resistance and beta cell fail failure. What are beta cells? They're the cells of our pancreases that uh, release insulin. Type 1 diabetes, childhood diabetes, is an autoimmune disease where the beta cells are attacked by the immune system and they don't release insulin. Type 2 diabetes is more of a problem with insulin resistance of our, of our cells, and that's related to obesity. And both diabetes and obesity are associated with systemic inflammation. And this cartoon uh, on the bottom right is showing that the Adipose tissue is not just fat storage. Uh, 
it's a it's an organ that has function and it both uh, is involved with it gets attacked during systemic inflammation and then it releases mediators that can uh, add to the inflammatory problem and, and insulin resistance and lead to multiple diseases, increased risk for multiple diseases. So uh, I, I said that there's some studies that link air pollution with obesity in kids. There's also studies that link air pollution and diabetes. There was some really elegant uh, studies from USC. It's been a collaboration from uh, pediatric endocrinologists who study diabetes in kids uh, and exposure scientists, uh, environmental epidemiologists. And so they, they had these kids being e extremely well characterized in terms of their response to glucose, their insulin uh, release, insulin resistance, measured in the laboratory, and they uh, knew the addresses, the home addresses of all these kids. They geocoded those addresses and assigned air pollution exposure based on the the home residents, something that uh, Rachel alluded to earlier. And uh, anyway, these studies have shown that traffic-related air pollution exposure, and these were minority kids, uh, Hispanic and African-American, uh, had higher fasting glucose and greater insulin resistance. Basically, you know, we used to think of type 2 diabetes as a disease of adults, but it's now becoming a disease of kids with our obesity epidemic in this country. So potential mechanism, uh, you know, air pollution, this is a mechanism by which air pollution can contribute to obesity and diabetes. It induces oxidative stress. What is that? The chemicals in air pollution, ozone, nitrous dioxide, the fine particles, especially diesel exhaust particles, when they, when these Contaminants in our, the air we breathe in get into our lungs. They actually cause chemical burns of the airway. These are highly reactive chemicals that cause generation of what's called reactive oxygen species. Our bodies are pretty good at responding to an oxidative stress, but they can be over. But the defenses can be overcome, and then you have what's called oxidative stress, more than the the normal. Uh, defense me mechanisms can handle. And that leads to local lung inflammation, which then can spill over into the systemic circulation. And PM 2.5, that's the fine particulate that I mentioned before. The really tiny particles make it down into the deep lung. They've been shown in animal models to induce fat tissue inflammation and insulin resistance in mouse models of diet induced obesity. And I actually have a photograph of a mouse that was in one of these studies. You can see that it's not a skinny mouse. And this has led to the hypothesis that exposure to air pollution in utero and in early childhood increases risk of abnormal glucose metabolism and obesity later in childhood and then actually later in the life course as adults. Uh, as other speakers today have uh, stated, we're really concerned about in utero exposures. The study I'm going to talk about, we have those uh, in utero exposure data for air pollution, but we haven't analyzed them yet, so I'm going to be talking about uh, early childhood exposures. So uh, I study Fresno uh, air pollution. Why? Uh, there's For those of you who don't know where Fresno is, <laughs> center of the state there. Uh, this is an actual photo of Fresno on a uh, polluted day. It gets pretty bad. It's actually the number two uh, worst city in the country in terms of unhealthy air for uh, particulate matter. It also has a lot of ozone exposure. And I started studying uh, air pollution health effects in kids in Fresno almost 20 years ago in the Fresno Asthmatic Children's Environment Study. And I'm, I'm happy to acknowledge one of my longtime colleagues in Fresno uh, Air Pollution Health Effects Study, Amy Padula, who's in the audience. Uh, Amy studied the effects of uh, reproductive, adverse reproductive outcomes related to uh, air pollution. I'm not going to talk about that today. 
Uh, so FACES was a panel study of asthmatic children uh, living within 20 kilometers of the EPA monitoring station so we could assign exposures. Uh, they were all asthmatic. And you know, our goal was to follow the course of asthma in relation to air pollution exposure. And here's, this is actually our, our study center uh, back then. And we measured lung function over time uh, as one way to assess asthma. And we always carefully take height and weight when we measure lung function because uh, they can, those are factors you have to take into consideration about whether a kid's or an adult's lung function is uh, within normal limits or not. And we noticed that the kids were always, uh, not always, but almost always on the overweight side. Uh, so then we, when we got, we, we initially had state funding and then we applied for uh, NIH and EPA funding. And uh, we came up with this uh, study that I'm going to tell you about. It's part of our Children's Environmental Health Center, CHAPS, Children's Health and Air Pollution Study. And my particular project that I'm going to share with you it was focused on the question, does air pollution contribute to obesity? And I say glucose dysregulation here. We didn't have enough power to study new onset diabetes in these kids, but we, we could look at a biomarker of glucose metabolism. And one thing that we had sort of special expertise about is uh, a type of pollutant called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which we all are exposed to. Whenever uh, a carbon-containing material is burned, you get these. And uh, we have particular expertise in this. We measured ambient air uh, pH exposure throughout Fresno. This is sort of a map. The bigger the circle, the higher the exposure. And so our question uh, for obesity glucose dysregulation was to determine whether exposure to ambient air pollutants, especially pHs, are associated with increased body mass, biomarkers of oxidative stress, systemic inflammation, and abnormal fat and glucose metabolism, and increased blood pressure. And for those of you who know about the metabolic syndrome in adults, these are basically risk factors for metabolic syndrome in adults. You're not supposed to talk about metabolic syndrome in kids yet. Uh, it's still controversial, but I think uh, we're increasingly realizing that it starts in childhood. I'm going to quickly go through, because of time, I'm not going to talk about our birth cohort, but it is a, we have these data. We have a child cohort that we recruited at age seven, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And we have uh, anthropometry. Uh, we measured their body uh, height, weight, et cetera. Uh, and we have biomarker measurements, and we can estimate air pollution exposure for all these kids. Uh, this slide, I just want to highlight that this is a minority population. 77% is Hispanic, and uh, uh, there's 13, almost 14% African American. So these were minority kids. And if you look down, you can see how poor they are. I mean, the household income of 30% was less than 15,000. And even in Fresno, it's hard to uh, live off of 15,000. So I'm going to quickly show you data. There are th always four traffic-related air pollutants on the slide. pH is on the left, NO2, PM2.5, and EC is elemental carbon, a marker of diesel exposure. This slide, BMI percentile for kids, pH is you know, anything above zero, especially where the line uh, around the dot also is above zero is statistically significant. So pHs and, and NO2. Hemoglobin A1C is our biomarker for glucose metabolism. Again, pH, uh, a little bit less of effect for NO2, a little bit of PM2.5. Urinary 8 isoprostane, that's a marker of oxidative stress. All the pollutants are associated with oxidative stress. No surprise. Uh, and this is the, the slide that most disturbs me. These are seven-year-old kids who are basically healthy, and we already are having a blood pressure effect. In fact, on average, our kids have higher blood pressure than the NHANES uh, national uh, average for kids. So in summary, uh, the prevalence of, of obesity and diabetes is high among Latino youth in the San Joaquin Valley. I didn't show you those data, but it is high. Uh, I think there's evidence from us and other uh, 
researchers that air pollution may increase the risk of both conditions, and oxidative stress and systemic inflammation are probably on the pathway, and childhood exposure to traffic-related air pollution is associated with outcomes consistent with increased risk of the metabolic syndrome, something that uh, older guys like me have a particular risk for. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, my colleagues uh, in the CHAPS study and the various in institutions that are, uh, have contributed to both our funding and our work. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. I um, have seen the um, dose response curves for PM2.5 exposure and cardiovascular outcomes, and we think of ourselves as in such a better position than places like China and India with their poor air quality, but I was struck by how early in the rise of concentrations those cardiovascular outcomes um, kick in, right? The, the rate of rise of um, increased cardiovascular outcomes comes very early in PM2.5 exposures. Um, do you know how that relates also to the obesity and glucose dysregulation outcomes? No, I don't know. I don't, there's not enough data with regard to obesity uh, and PM2.5. I just actually went to a meeting uh, earlier this week on the dose response curve PM2.5 and cardiovascular outcomes. And it, you, you're exactly right. It, the steepest part of that exposure response is early on when things are relatively clean, and then it flattens off at high exposures. So, it actually suggests that it's not just Beijing and Delhi that need to clean up their air, but we still need to clean up our air because we're on that steep portion of the curve. 